morning. Good morning. Uh, so uh, the the third assignment solution has been posted. Um, I guess you know you haven't got a chance to look at it. Yeah, no, but we kind of reviewed that module. And if you have any questions after, I think I've provided enough details. But if you have any questions after reviewing that, feel free to reach out. Um, so today we will continue to review and we will um, uh, go, you know, skip the income taxes. We covered most of that. We'll go to, over to the first two chapters of the course. And the first, um, let's just talk a little bit about the uh, midterm. So midterm, uh, like on the course outline, is scheduled for 10 to 12 tomorrow. Yes, it's tomorrow. Uh, it's on Bright Space and it's closed book. There are seven questions. So three on chapter 16, I have one on derivative one on hybrid securities, one on stock op, uh, compensation plans, stock option compensation plan. Uh, two on chapter 17. So one is a short one, just on weighted average shares. And one is about the computation of both basic and diluted earnings shares. Uh, and uh, a two on income tax, this chapter 18, uh, one is like a big question is about the, um, just income taxes. You have to determine uh, current and deferred income taxes. Uh, current income taxes, uh, you need to convert accounting income into taxable income. Whereas deferred tax, we use uh, revenue expense coach, deferred, as, uh, deferred tax assets, deferred, no, sorry, did I say revenue expense? Asset liability approach. So, in, in order to uh, determine deferred tax, you need to de determine deferred tax assets or liability first. Now, to limit the scope of this question, uh, there's only one temporary difference, one permanent difference, a uh, one tax rate. So, that simplifies the situation a lot. Uh, what make it a little bit more complicated is there's a beginning balance on the balance sheet related to deferred tax, because that is the part that's really important that change in deferred tax assets or liability will lead to deferred tax expense or benefit, right? Without the beginning balance, if you are confused with that, it doesn't show because deferred tax assets, deferred tax liability with the same amount as deferred tax expense or deferred tax benefit. With the beginning balance, then you have to know it's the change. Um, so now on the course outline, it says two hours and it is two hours exam. So however, I set the clock at the two and a half hours because um, you know when you have to type all the answer, it takes a bit of longer time. So I gave it two and a half an hour just, just because of that. Okay. Um, okay. So like I already created this exam. So I think if you go to your bright space, you can see the instruction on the exam. Right, it's already there. You can see the instruction on the exam. It's a closed book of the exam. Um, you do need to show, you do need to answer the question clearly, as I mentioned earlier. If you just uh, show a number ambiguously, um, then I will not grade that because, like, you know, it's like you just did a part and I will have to fill in the blanks. Um, th that's not a complete answer. So you should answer the question clearly and only answer what's asked. Um, you need to show if the computation is involved, you need to show your work. Uh, so like, because if you just uh, say, if I ask you, what is the diluted earning per share? And you go ask, I will answer a question. Here's the diluted earning per share. I don't know where you get a number, right? Even if it's correct, I have no idea where you get a number. So you have to show your work. Otherwise, 
I may not accept it just because, you know, that's weird. You know, you need to show you answer. And I give you extra half hours to show that, uh, so show your work, right? And then with the work, I can follow your uh, thread of thinking, you know, so I was able, I would be able to give you partial credit if it's only small part of your work is off and the rest there seems to be fine. So that's that. I think, um, uh, you like, I think, I mean, it's hard to control, but uh, we have a calculator department has the calculator policy. You guys are familiar with that. So you do need a calculator and you need uh, um, lots of pa paper to work things out, you know, things like that. Any other question? I think, I don't think you need a present value table for this exam. Okay, so I'm, I'm not proud for the next exam, I will provide the pre present value table. This one, um, I know some of the questions uh, in the textbook or in our practice requires you to do that, but I made it go away in the matter. You don't need that, you can always get around. So that's about the exam. I think uh, I covered everything. You no, you don't need to sign it because uh, I, I some schools are very strict. They they allow you to sign in and you have to show the whole room. No one else is there. Know that. <laughs> uh, I I kind of make the question as such. Hopefully, you know it's better off you just do it rather than trying to <laughs> circumvent that. You know. Anyways, uh, that's always the hard part because I'm not trained police officers, so I don't like to enforce things like that way, you know? Okay, any other questions? So you just, at, at the time, like it's, now you can see it, but you can't open exam because it hasn't started yet. So by 10 tomorrow, you'll be able to go in it. Okay, so hopefully everything. Oh, one last thing. So I said it in such like all the questions, all seven questions will be listed there. So you can click, you can go back and forth easily. I think that's easier than you have to just actually move the page. So all the um, question is here. You just hit that and you can go back and forth, okay? Uh, yeah, you can go back and forth. So allocate your time. Like if you got stuck on one question, don't bury everything on that one question, okay? Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah. thank you, yes. Uh, the, se uh, the second question, I think I answered, you don't need to log in the Zoom. The first one, is it a mandatory the exam is typed? Uh, yes. Yes, because you they have this uh, um, uh, HT um, ML editor. Yeah, so you need to type it in there, yes. No, no, it's, a, it's a similar to the quiz style, okay? It's similar to the quiz style. Oh, yeah, thank, yeah, we need, thanks for uh, bringing it up so I can clarify that we do not want um, surprise. Surprise is not good. Okay, it, you know, uh, let's, let's move on. And if you have questions, feel free just to um, join in, okay? Oh, so I, I'm already sharing this, so. Uh, if you have any questions, just, just interact. Okay. So uh, the first one is about the derivatives. Okay. The first one is about the derivatives. And so like, uh, so now we already talked about this. So we can, we can kind of uh, go back to be a little bit of philosophical about the things, right? Take a step back. So for instance, this, this example on July 1st, um, Alpha Company Corporation purchased a put option for 2,400, giving it a right to sell because I, I want to do, do a put because we do call all the time as if call is a word. No, there, there are many other different derivatives. So for instance, there's a put option. Give it right to sell 2,000 shares of Omega uh, Corp for $20 per share. 
On December 20, uh, 31st, 2020, the option value is $12,000. On January 6, 2021, Omega settles option for cash. Well, Omega, oh no, that should not be, uh, should it be Alpha? Alpha sell, settles uh, the option for cash. Well, Omega shares are trading at $15 per share. So, so we have an option, as we said, that like a option is one of the example of the derivative. Right? So this is a security that's derived from the underlying item. Right? So here we have a put option. It's derived from Omega shares. Okay. So um, put options value is linked to the Omega shares value. So in this case, if Omega shares increase how does the option value changes decrease does that make sense yeah but if it's a call option it will be the other way around right so what it tells you is that um that the fact is the company paid two thousand four hundred dollar to buy the put option okay and the option, so it must have shares, right? Must have shares of Omega, uh, want to sell it in the future. And uh, um, when the shares were sold, how much did Omega get per share? $20. Now without the put option, it can only get $15, right? But with the option, it get $20. So these are the facts. It doesn't matter how you account it. What happened is um, Alpha entered into the uh, purchase the option, and then sometime later, which is uh, 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 the early next year, it sold two thousand shares. At, at the time, the share price is fifteen dollars per share, but because it had option, it sold for twenty dollar per share. Okay, so is it good for them to enter the option or not? It is, right? Because by entering the option, they got $5 more per share. And for 2,000 shares, that's $10,000 more they got than without option. And an old option only cost them $2,400, right? So by entering... Uh, uh, the total gain from the option, from the put option, is what? Is uh, 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 7,600. How did I get that? It's like without the option, uh, it will only get $15 for each share it sold on January 6, 2021, okay? With the option, it got um, $20. So that's a $5 more. And for 2,000 shares, they got $10,000 more with the put option. Without it, it will only, you know, oh, uh, uh, the, the put option only cost the two thousand four hundred dollars, so therefore um, they are better off by this amount. So this will be the total gain. Okay, that's the fact. Whatever accounting method you use is not going to change that, right? Now, the accounting for derivatives is a fair value through net income, right? That's essentially it. So what difference does it make, okay? What is a, What does it accomplish? What does it accomplish is, well, in this case, there is a fiscal year end between the time the options were purchased and the time the options uh, were settled, okay? So there is a fiscal year end. Since at 
on that date, uh, alpha has this put option as an uh, I could asset, as an asset, because it's an option. If it's like a, a future or forward, it could be liability too, right? But the, because of the option, you'll only use it when it has value to you. So the, at the minimum, it's zero. It's not, you're not going to lose, um, have a liability on it. So on December 31st, 2020, it's a physical year end. Alpha needs to release issue financial statements. And on the financial statements, it is going to report that, this one. And this uh, fair value through net income only matters is you have to measure this option on the statement of financial position date. Okay, so there's a total gain that's a total gain you can realize eventually. Now, um, on December 31st, nothing is realized yet because the option is not exercised yet. However, fair value to net income would require us to measure the options regardless, it's settled or not. And then any gains or losses would it be unrealized gain or loss should it be recognized recognized through net income. That's like a, the, the kind of a, uh, what this fair value through net income accounting for derivatives accomplish. On the statement of financial position date, any derivatives you carry, okay, you need to measure it at the fair value and show it on the balance sheet at their fair values. And then any gains or loss that may have occurred since the last time you measure it or since you purchase it uh, will be unrealized gain or loss and go through the income statement. Okay, so if you recognize too much gain, subsequently when it's realized there will be a loss, right? If you didn't recognize enough, more gains will be realized. And so eventually, so this is seven, uh, $1,600 will be included in income statements of two periods. Period, the first period is 2020 and then 2021. But when you combine these two together, it should be 7,600, right? Does that make sense? Because that's a fact, that's a fact. Now, fair value to net income is basically, bit, if you wait, for everything is settled, you know exactly how much gain you realized or loss you realized. However, we are required to report before everything is said and done. And that's based on the situation at a time. And subsequently, if things changed uh, further, then you, know, um, you have to adjust for that. So basically the seven, uh, 1,600 is, is, so uh, let's see, um, how do we record this? So on July 5th, uh, 2020, so the journal entry will be debit. I would just call it option and uh, you can use financial assets or liabilities or derivatives, but I think a put option is actually very descriptive. By now, we should all know it is a derivative. It is a financial asset uh, since you paid for it. So that will be 2,400 and you pay cash to purchase that. 2,400. And on December uh, 31st, uh, 2020, so you, you need to, um, assess the fair value. So the fair value at this time is given as 12,000. What do you think happened to uh, Gamma's uh, Omega's share price? The share price must drop. You know, when the share price drops, this put option value goes up, right? The more it drops, the more valuable the put option. So in this case, they told us. So if they like, uh, so this question, we give you parsimonious information. All the information given here, you need. Lots of questions, they give you a lot of extra information like a 
share price because we know the relationship, right? But you have to know not everything given to you, you have to use it, right? It's, you, you need to know because we're only reporting the option. So uh, we need to add uh, well, how much? 9,600, right? Because it's already too like that. Don't put 12,000 here. That's the level. That's the balance we want. And there's already 2,400 in there. So only needed 9,600. And this is the amount that's a, a 12,000. It's the balance we want. And 2,400 is the balance we have. Okay, so we need to do that. And that amount is the unrealized gain. So that's 9,000. 600. Okay, so on the balance sheet, the options will show at 12,000 fair value. That's a requirement. In order to give the option a value of 12,000, we need to debit, uh, put option, derivative, financial asset, and then we need to credit something. So change in the asset value give rise to the gain. More specifically, when asset value increases, like this one, you have a gain. Okay. And then on June, January 6, 2021. Oh, that's the date of riot. I, th I, th I think that's why the number stuck in my head. The date stuck in my head. Uh, so it's a, um, a settled. Um, for cash. So that means, well, like, um, so now with the option, you can get a $20 per share without a 15, that's $5 difference. You will get the difference. Okay. You don't actually have to sell shares. Okay. You don't actually have to sell shares. You can just take it there. So uh, the cash to be received is, um, 10,000, the cash to be received is 10,000. Okay, and we need to do the credit side. So let's do that. Credit side, we need to um, remove the put option, which is uh, measured at 12,000. So the carrying amount is, a 12,000, but the value of the option is like at this time, yeah, the value of the option is not given, but we don't need a value of option here, right? Ah, Ling Ling. When it's settled. Um, so what, what do we have? We have a loss and this is realized loss, right? realize the loss, uh, which is 2000, okay? It will be even better if we kind of um, uh, indicate clearly, this is income statement. Um, oh, okay. let's just put it over here a little bit. align it a little bit better. And so it will be even better if we show that we know for certain because fair value through net income means this unrealized gain is um, part of the um, net income. Either that or this, right? So that will be clear. Uh, sometimes unrealized gain can go into other comprehensive income. Okay, so uh, any question? Yeah, be aware of all the information that's given, it's irrelevant. Okay. Uh, I had this question in the early version of uh, the midterm, and then I removed that. Uh, uh, 
So let's have a look at that. We talk about hedging, right? So this is a multiple choice question. Which of the following statements is correct? Hedge accounting is the use of derivatives or other instruments to increase returns. The use of derivatives or other instruments to offset risks. And the use of accounting method to offset the gain and loss of the hedged and the hedging items. Oh, I don't know what is uh, this one. Uh, okay. And, and then the last one, the use of forward contracts. Well, uh, I didn't create a poll, uh, poll so the people on, on cannot participate. What do you think? C? Yeah, C? Why not B? B is a vague. Why not A? No, that's not the point. To like, a, if 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 if, if you are a speculator, maybe. Yeah. Right, this is like speculator will be the other party of the transaction, right? If you're the hedging party, you that's not the goal. The goal for hedging is uh, to minimize uncertainty, right? So the risk of one would offset the other. You guys are right. I'm trying to, I'm pulling your legs. Uh, uh, you guys, it's a C is the correct, but why? Because the hedging and the hedge accounting are not exactly the same thing. I'm asking about the hedge accounting. If a question is hedging, then the, the objective of hedging is to use derivatives and other instruments to offset risks. Okay, so that's what um, uh, people do, or companies do to manage their risks. But we are a, um, we're in accounting course. So we, you know, we focus on how to account for that, right? As we said sometimes, because derivatives are measured at fair value through net income. So hedging items, you know, uh, um, Typically, without a hedge accounting, would be always fair value through net income. But the hedged items may not, right? So therefore, if the hedged items is counted um, with the something other than fair value through net income, then you have the situation. In reality, the risks offset, but uh, in your financial statement, particularly in your income statement, they do not, and that's called the uh, uh, asymmetry, right? It's asymmetry. So hedge accounting would ensure that uh, that that you can offset them on your income statement as well as in reality, right? So that's the uh, difference between hedge and hedge uh, hedging and hedge accounting, accounting or hedging. Uh, it's good to know, but I do not have a question on hedge or hedge accounting. Uh, one more thing about hedge accounting, it's optional, right? It's optional. Like a company can just choose their whatever the way for derivatives and, and the, uh, for the hedging item and just carry on the hedge item as if they're unrelated. You can do that, but as we said, the, in the financial statement, you do have these asymmetric situation. But if you want to restore that symmetry, you do have an option. So it's optional. Uh, so that's about that. A hybrid securities is complex because it's like a compound, 
uh, uh, has uh, two components. Okay, we always said that, like, I think, I don't think we always did, but I think in the textbook it mentioned that, and I mentioned that too. It has two components, and it has a debt component, it has an equity component. But sometimes you could just have two equity components. Okay, it does not always have to be a debt component and equity component. So, so here's the example, like the one you have two uh, equity components. You have convertible preferred shares. Okay. So preferred shares, that's one security, but the potential, the conversion rights is another uh, uh, security, like a conversion rights. Um, some this time the really conversion rights will not stand alone, right? You, if you don't have the preferred shares conversion rights, it doesn't really help you. You don't have anything to convert. But sometimes they actually have standalone too. Like for instance, you could have a bank uh, issued with the option with a warrant. So this warrant can be separated from the bank and you can use this warrant very much like as an option, use it to purchase shares at the price that's previously determined. So then you actually have two things. The warrants can be treated separately if you want, right? So you could actually have, but in this case, so that's why the division, we have one thing, or do we have two things. Uh, and I think in the end, it was a convertible preferred shares is really different from preferred shares. So there is something different, okay? And so, and the ifers, these two things should be separate. And uh, and then you always, if when you have a debt, you always me measure the debt first, okay? Uh, and there has to be uh, a kind of, I guess this is the place that they give you more choice. You can, you can measure one first and then give the residual to the other, or you can just give it, ignore that conversion rights altogether, okay? Um, so, uh, in this case, it's a bit uh, easier. So let's say if we go with it first, how, what was the cash received by um, uh, Algiers? So they issued 10,000 preferred shares, which are convertible for $103 per share, right? And so in this case, um, so we will receive um, one million one million and uh, thirty thousand dollars. okay and the if we must uh, allocate this amount between the two things and so uh, preferred shares, uh, without the conversion rights is $100 per share. So that's $1 million. And as a result of that uh, conversion rights, uh, it, this is equity, additional paid in capital, right? Um, is that additional paid in capital conversion rights? So that one will be the remainder, that is uh, 30,000. Now, this example is a kind of a uh, different from the convertible debt uh, because a convertible debt, if the debt is issued not as a part, so the debt balance actually changes. Right, if you issue at a premium, as time goes down, the premium will be amortized. And so the debt balance will go down. If the debt is issued at the discount, the discount will be amortized. So the balance of the debt will increase. Okay, but this is not the, the debt. So that's why it's simple. So after this happened, this two accounts, uh, these two accounts, Well, balance will stay at those amounts. Okay, 
So when the conversion comes, what happened it was you received this amount, uh, you issue these two. And when the conversion comes, these two became common shares, right? So therefore, if you look at your book, these are the two things. So, so basically, if you think about it, when everything's said and done, whatever the shares, these convertible preferred shares are converted to, fetched you this amount, $1,030,000, right? So therefore, when the conversion comes, that's what you should do. You should, uh, uh, these two amounts will be debited because now they're gone. And in its place, you put in common shares and that will be one million and thirty thousand dollars okay so i think this example uh, really highlights um the the book value method why the book value method because at the time the fair value of the common shares could be different. Usually the fair value of the common shares will be higher, right? That's why that's like, that's attractive to convert because it, right now after the preferred shares are issued, you have like this potential, you can convert your preferred shares to common shares. Uh, uh, but unless it's advantageous, you don't have to do that. If the company is not doing so well, the common share price is low. With this, you can just hold your preferred shares, get your preferred dividends, right? You know, it's a lot, you know, you have that security in a way. And then if the um, situation improves, then then you can convert. So that's, that's the attraction of this, okay? That's the attraction of this. But, when you convert from a company's perspective, I issued these shares. That's what like uh, 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 each one can convert into three shares. So like this, you issued a 30,000 common shares in the end when they're converted, right? But this 30,000 shares get you this amount. You do not get money. You, you Whatever the price it is, say the at that time, the price is like a $50 per share. And for, um, right? So each share you get $50 for that uh, 30,000, you should get the $1,500,000. You didn't get that because you didn't sell those shares at their uh, price at that time. Instead, what you get is this amount. And this amount is carried here. So that's why when it's converted, um, the fair value, the thirty dollar uh, per share. Oh, that's thirty dollar per share. It's irrelevant. Okay, it's irrelevant. Okay, so that's that. Now let's look at a similar example because this one, um, that one is simple, but this one is the convertible debt. Okay, so um, six million dollar par value debt, nine percent. Uh, uh, th those are convertible bands. They are issued at the 98. Um, there's lots of other information. And uh, but the, the last sentence is what are we looking at? If the bond had not been convertible, they would have sold for 96.1. So clearly the convertible feature is valuable. That's why you were able to issue it at more, right? So, uh, and then it says on April 1st, 2020. So that's like a few months later, the unamortized discount of the bond is $216,000. Um, and then these convertible bonds are converted to common shares. Okay, so that's look what happens to this one com compared to the other one. So under it first, the cash received would be 
um, five million seven hundred sixty six thousand at the ninety eight. Okay, so bonds payable would it be at the ninety six point one? So, oh no, sorry, that's not that's the number for that. But this is a five. 1,880,000, but at the 96.1, that is $5,766,000,000 uh, dollars and thousand dollars. And then additional paid in capital, that's a conversion, Right. Um, I don't want to put it right. So that is um, one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. Okay. So uh, this time, however. Um, this bonds payables value is going to go up or go down as time passes. Will go up. It has a discount, right? And discount will be amortized. So, uh, uh, judging by the information given by April first, this amount has become uh, five million seven hundred eighty four thousand how did i get that well it's a six million minus uh two one six thousand because we were told that the remaining unamortized discount is two one six right so that amount like indeed has gone up Okay, now what happened to this one? What happened to this one? Huh? What happened to this one? Uh, conversion right? How? Why? That doesn't change. Yeah, right? Conversion rights, so that it, that's how the, you recorded there. And then the nothing happened. We never made adjustment. Now, this bond payable change is there must be interest paid uh, since it's issued. Uh, and then each time interest paid, the payment will be less than the interest expense. And the difference is the amortization of discount. Right, then nothing happened to this one. We, it just left it on the uh, 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 balance sheet in the T accounts. Nothing happened. Right. So when the conversion starts, it, these two amounts, these are the book value. Right. These two amounts will be um, will be transferred into the common shares. Uh, they are converted into. Does that make sense? Yeah, right? So that's what the book value um, method means. Okay, so what happens, you have these two on your balance sheet, but the, when the conversion takes place, those two are gone. Instead, you have common shares on your balance sheet, and that common share will take the value of these two that, that they replace. Does it make sense? Okay, so so I don't think I need to do the journal entry. Do I need to? Maybe I'll do it because you know what? If I don't do it, um, I if I yeah I will do it. So we'll have re replace. Uh, so this is the journal entry on, um, let's give the date, it's on um, July 
July 2nd, uh, 2020. Okay, so that's what happened. Uh, that's not nice. Okay, so that's, and then there are things happening between, right? There's things happening between where we're just like, there were like the interest of paid and then there's a fiscal year end and all that. Uh, so we're not uh, asked to do anything about that. So we, we just skip all that. Instead, we would just go straight to the, uh, to this uh, April 1st, uh, 2021 and let's assume everything is up to date you know like uh, just we just worry about the conversion so this is show that value says all adjustments is already done okay all the adjustments are up to date uh up to date so that's like uh, um like the 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 bounds so show the value they told us to be so in this case we'll remove bounds payable oh, I don't know why. um yeah so you see why i give you a little extra time when you type things so kind of you know in, in the midterm if if you things show up like a yellow just leave it a yellow don't worry about it uh conversion right That's uh, one one four, and then the common shares would it be um, the sum of that five eight nine eight. Okay, so this is the book value method. Uh, okay, how are we doing with the time? Okay, um, I want to cover everything, so uh, not, 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 no time to panic yet. We still have time. Okay, uh, so about the stock option plan. So that's like a, among the various stock based compensation, we only did this one because this one is the big one. It's oh my god. The important thing is to again understand how it works, right? So the timeline is really important for to, to understand the accounting of that. So here is uh, several dates. Uh, we have like a grant date. Uh, things happen, you need to have this approved and everything, right? But the, a starting grant date almost like you start your clock because this is like a, um, we know the stock option they will be more valuable if the stock price are higher right so that's the case so the idea is given that dynamic uh, hopefully with the granting of the stock option the the employees would be motivated to work harder okay so that's so whatever the value of the option, uh, it, 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 it's supposed to be incurred to give the employee incentive to work hard during this period. So this uh, the period between grant date and the vesting date, it's called the vesting period. And this is normally also called the service period. So the assumption is the, the, the options are granted to uh, provide incentive to the receivers to work harder during this period, okay? So from a company's perspective, they will receive the service, the value of the service during this period. And so therefore, you only recognize compensation expense in that period, not before, not after. Okay, now what is the compensation expense that is also determined on the grant date? 
It's you already determined that on the grand date. Okay, on the grand date, you use whatever the mo like uh, the models. Brad Blacken shows is the only one I know of. I don't even know it. I just know of it because I have never uh, had needed to apply it to actually estimate option value. But uh, so I guess uh, uh, if we want to uh, summarize these uh, important uh, things, that I will do it here. So uh, the total compensation expense is the value of the options on the grant date. So this one, okay. So that's one thing. And then what else we need to know? Okay. The compensation expense is recognized, recognition and measurement. So we answer both, but is recognized during the vesting period. Just like any other compensation expense. And we recognize typically at the end of the period. So that's why on the grant date, usually no journal entry is required, right? The kind of clock starts, but it, you know, you recognize the compensation expense after the service is received. Okay, so that's that. Uh, so again, when they're exercised, uh, it's a, it's a so tempting to say, well, when the options are exercised, uh, that you know the company will issue additional shares, right? And we all know how to record share issuance because you know they will be issued supposedly whatever the price they are at the time. But this is again, it's not the not the, that's not what happened. Instead. Um, the price, the cash you can receive is predetermined because the option has an exercise price and you are obligated to issue shares to the employees at that price. Okay, so therefore when um, the options are exercised, you do not, you ignore the market price of the stock at the time, right? You ignore the market price of the stock at a time. Instead, what you get would it be the exercise price that's determined by option and the compensation expense you recognize during the service or vest vesting period. Okay, so when the options are exercised, um, the common shares are valued um, as the sum of the uh, option exercise price and estimated option uh, value. Uh, on the grant date. Does it make sense? Okay. Okay, so does it allow me to do this? So, okay, here. Okay, so here, 
this chart. This is how you look at this. So uh, after the vesting period, you could use the option now. However, usually you're given a period. You're given like you, you can use it any time until the options are expired. Okay, so uh, there will be no compensation expense recognized after the vesting date. Okay, even though the benefit to the employees who receive the options could still vary, right? Because the stock price will continue to change, right? So if the stock price goes up, they still benefit more, but from company's perspective, they will no longer recognize any compensation expense, regardless which way the stock price change goes. Okay, so yeah, so after that, just record, remember that. So usually with employees, they will try to, um, you know, uh, based on their judgment to exercise when it's uh, advantageous to them. And sometimes they judge wrong, run out of time, they would, they may expire. There are other considerations such as tax and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's what I want to say about that. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so any questions? Earnings per share. So the basic idea is on the top is the earning available to common shareholders, uh, the denominator that is a weighted average number of shares outstanding, right? That's like right, the guiding basic uh, principle. And if the company has a simple uh, capital structure, then you only need to compute basic earning per shares. So the denominator is weighted average shares outstanding. The numerator would be net income minus preferred dividends. And then there's like, a, oh, that depends on whether the dividends are declared or not, depends on the preferred shares accumulated or not. There are some details. One thing that came up is like uh, that, what did you do with the common dividends? What do you, uh, don't subtract it. And I think one of the questions give you the total dividends the company paid, okay? So then that's the situation, well, the total dividends company paid, uh, that includes preferred and common dividends. So we have to parse them out, only subtract the preferred dividends because we want earnings belong to common shareholders on the numerator. We don't care if those earnings are distributed or not. Right? Some part of that may be distributed, part of them may not, but they all belong to the common shareholder and then we want them all on the numerator. Okay, so that's um, one thing come out. I just want to clarify. And for diluted earning per shares, uh, convert the, with two groups of potentially dilutive securities, convertibles and options warrant, right? Convertibles, uh, we use if converted method. And this one impact both numerators and the denominator. And uh, so the calculation, um, is basically if it's a preferred shares, then if it's converted, there will be no preferred dividends and more shares will be issued. If the convertible bonds, if converted, there will be no interest, after tax interest. Don't forget tax. There's no after tax dividends, all after tax, right? But the only interest. So, so there will be no interest. So after tax interest will be added on the numerator and additional shares that would be issued will be added to the denominator. Option warrants, we use, uh, these are the call options, okay? And we use treasury stock method, okay? And this only affect the denominator, have no impact on numerator, okay? So, we treasury method is 
Number of shares will be issued when options and warrants are exercised. Subtract number of treasury shares you can purchase with the proceed. Lots of times people kind of get parts of a right and they've got shares issued and or shares purchased. No, you need to compute both. And it's the difference is the incremental shares. This will be um, at a minimum, it will be zero. You will never have the case you will have a uh, uh, you you will be able to purchase more shares back than you issued because if that's the case, that means options are out of money, and then that there will be no reason for the holders to exercise them. Okay, the last thing I want to say is um, for diluted earning per share, we need to be aware of anti-dilutive situation and to uh, to get the lowest possible diluted earning per share every time, we need to follow this four-step approach. And so uh, this is the uh, based on the question in the uh, homework. And I, um, some people actually get all the calculation right, but they did not get the right conclusion because this is what they did, right? They, they, they calculated the um, common, uh, like the basic earning per share based on the existing common shares only, uh, correctly, 4.34. And then they look at the, each of these potentially diluted, there are three of them, securities. And then they look at this, they look at the incremental earning per shares, like the impact on the numerator, on the top and impact on the bottom. And they look at, they look at the old dilute because they all less than 4.34. So they go, fine, I add old impact on the top, old impact on the bottom, and they got 3.83. That's a wrong answer. That's wrong answer. Because after you put this, like you, if you go by the, step-by-step step approach, you rank them first. And then you add each one. So as you add each one, the earning per shares will go down. And you will find when you add this first one and it goes down, you add the second one, this will be ranked. Uh, if you go by the rank, so this will be the first most dilutive one, right? This will be ranked first, and uh, this will be ranked the second. This will be ranked the second, and this will be ranked third. And after you uh, include the first one in, after we include this, your earning per share become 4.09. And then after you put a second one in, this will be this one. Um, it, the earning per share become 3.81. And that will be less than this 4.0. So this one is a convertible bounds are actually anti-dilutive. But if you do not follow the step, do it systematically, uh, you may not see that. You're just judging by this, they all dilute, right? But then you will have a, a earning per share 3.83 rather than the correct one, 3.81. Okay, so that's that's that. I think that's everything that I had you, you you can go back because I post the solution on this one you can go back to check actually let me bring it up uh, to, to show it just uh, APIC stands for additional paid in capital uh, I just saw the question now sorry okay ACIP yeah 
are we allowed to do Excel and paste into Brightspace? Yes, you are. Yeah, I would prefer that much, much better than you uh, like upload the file. Okay, so you please you can you can copy paste, but do, you know try not to upload the file. Any other questions? Okay. Um, if not, that means um, I think I post that. I would just go to the bright space to bring it up and we'll look at it together. Oh, that's the that's the wrong one. Sorry. Okay, so that's the one. Okay, I'm just share this uh, solution, right? So we we previously we calculated incremental earning per share, and we ranked options first, convertible preferred to second, and the convertible bound is the third. So we do it one by one. We start with the four point three four, and we incorporate the first now the um, number one ranked dilutable securities. And that brings the earning per share, we just add 60,000 to the numerator, a denominator. So the earning per share becomes 4.09. And then we move on to the second ranked item, which is convertible preferred shares. So we add, I think this is a bit of a bit off, but anyways, we add um, um, uh, then to the numerator is 160, denominator is 120. So the earning per share becomes 3.8. Eight one, and then you know you don't even have to. You can see that the incremental shares for the convertible bond is more than that. But I can go through that. You add the numerator, denominator, and lo and behold, the the earning per shares become three point eight three. So that means this convertible bond is anti dilutive. So your answer should be here. The diluted earning per share is 3.81. If you just do the calculation without this last statement, you really did not answer the question, right? You did all the calculation, and but you did not um, answer the question, what is the diluted earning per share? So there you go. Uh, you can only ensure that if you follow that you know, step-by-step -step approach. Rank them first, and then add one by one according to the rank. Stop adding anything once it's earning per share, stop going down, okay? Uh, so I think that's a good place to stop. Any questions? Uh, I think no questions. Um, then, uh, I'll sign off here and the good luck tomorrow. Um, start 10 and it, you have two and a half an hour. Okay. Hi, Professor. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding assignment three. Assignment three, yes. 
Um, could you please um, explain again about the PPE, please? Um, which okay. is the similar question, which is the same similar question uh, on the practice problem 18 um, dash one. Yes. Um, yeah, so <laughs> could you just like explain uh, some details about the PPE again, please? Uh, could you pinpoint like which part of it? I can bring the solution up uh, and yeah. could you be a little bit, um, if you want to go, you can go. Yeah, okay. Um, so let me go back uh, to the, Solution. Um, so actually, uh, the question is about a practice problem 18 dash one. Um, you said the like after computing the counting depreciation and CCA of 2016 and 2017, uh, one should conclude that the book value of PPE is $24,000 more than the um, UCC. Um, and I know how you get the $24,000. Um, uh, I, I, I don't recall off the bat. So what's your question is your question is how that $24,000 $24, is come about. $24,000 uh, in general, it will be the difference between book value and the carrying amount of the book value and the UCC, book value is the carrying amount. So it's, an, um, it's not that the difference in depreciation, I think, uh, but based on what you said, it's after two years, right? Right. Yeah, so it's not that the difference between the depreciation and the CCA of year two, it's the cumulative difference, right? Um, it's a difference between the book value and the UCC, okay? And the re reason for that is a book value is what you can deduct in the future for accounting purpose. And UCC is what you can deduct uh, in the future for tax purpose. And usually uh, UCC will be lower than book value. So in the future, uh, there will be less to deduct for accounting, for tax purpose than for accounting purpose. So therefore this is a, this difference in the future will cause taxable income to be lower. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, taxable income to be higher because the, the deduction is lower, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore it will be caused that tax will income to be higher in the future and that's taxable difference. Mm -hmm. so that 24,000 is tax, taxable difference. And the next step uh, in the problem 18.1 and in the assignment is the, the deferred tax liability would it depend on one, this difference will reverse and uh, the tax rate of in the period, the difference, the periods, the difference are reversed. Mm -hmm. So that, give the, that gives you the measurement for deferred tax liability. Uh, in the exam, uh, we have a single tax rate, so therefore, one, the difference is reversed, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, this is, uh, is really challenging. Uh, sorry, and uh, regarding the assignment um, number three, the question A part two, um, I just saw the answer you posted um, and there is a table there um, I was trying to get the book value by myself, um, but I couldn't really capture the, the information I 